Welcome to the MANA webinar on business, legal, and tax business applications for reps in the COVID-19 world. I'm Charlie Cohn. I'm the CEO of MANA, and our panelists are John Davis, MANA's chairperson and CEO of rep firm Paul Davis Automation in Chardon, Ohio, Dan Biederman, MANA's legal counselor, counsel and a partner in the law firm Schoenberg, Finkel, Newman, and Rosenberg LLC in Chicago, and Bruce Bell, a partner at law firm Schoenberg, Finkel, Newman, Rosenberg, LLC in Chicago. Bruce is also a certified public accountant. Welcome, gentlemen. Welcome, guests. Uh, thank you for being with us today. Hello. Thank you. John, Hello. first questions for you, John. How do I put myself in my customer's shoes so I will know the best ways to engage with them in the current environment? Oh, well, I, Charlie, I think that's a relatively straightforward one. Um, I know that a lot of customers have been disrupted uh, in their daily lives, just like all of us have, and everybody's routine has changed. Um, there's a lot of people who find their spouses at home, their kids at home, maybe working out of a, especially if they're not used to working at home, working out of a smaller environment. And uh, I think that's the same for a lot of uh, reps as well. Uh, although we travel quite a bit, there are many reps who um, – uh, work from home or, or work from a small office and they find themselves in a new spot. So I, I think the common ground that we can all find is that nobody has a normal schedule anymore. A lot of things have been disrupted and just recognize that with your customer and realize we're all in the same boat. Fair enough. Thank you. Dan, how would you characterize the impact that COVID-19 has had on the legal issues confronting the businesses you represent? Any general observation or trends? Thank you, Charlie. Um, as John indicated, uh, we are all in the same boat. This is uncharted territory. COVID-19 permeates all aspects of our personal and professional lives, and its effect still is unknown. As far as legal issues, especially legislation, it continues to adopt and adapt and evolve. Sometimes it's a moving target only because of the nature of the legislation. The CARES Act, for instance, is over 800 pages and still does not provide all the information necessary for people to uh, uh, utilize its benefits. And the effects on businesses, legal matters, uh, really they share the same type of questions and issues, whether they're large or small, whether they're sales reps or manufacturers or distributors or others. Because no matter what type of business you have, your central question is, on a legal level, how can you weather the storm? So the same type of questions over the last four or five weeks or more have come into our office dealing with contract issues and performance, dealing with uh, HR personnel issues, and of course, more recently, dealing with legislation, the CARES Act, the uh, Paycheck uh, Program, and the uh, FFCRA. Thank you. Uh, Bruce, can I ask you to please explain the new rules on the federal payroll tax deferral? Sure. Uh, the uh, Congress has now provided a payroll tax deferral for uh, wages which are paid basically from, from now through December 31st of 2020. Now, it's not a complete payroll tax deferral. It's a deferral on the employer's share of FICA taxes. So for each employee's salary, 6.2% uh, is withheld for FICA taxes. An additional 1.45% is withheld for Medicare taxes, and then the employer matches those funds withheld from the employee's checks. It's the 6.2% which qualifies for the, uh, for the uh, deferral, and one half of it has to be paid by December 31st of 2021, uh, and then the balance paid by uh, December 31 of 2022. Um, the deferral should be noted, we're going to talk quite a bit today about the payroll protection uh, provisions, the, the PPP loans. Um, the deferral ends once you tap into your uh, PPP loan funds. Thank you. I have a toss-up question for whoever uh, would like to take it from a rep. I am an S-Corp, and I am the only direct employee at the company which I own. I have an SBA, SBA loan number for my salary, but it has not been funded yet uh, against the 100000 annual salary limit. Is there a downside to getting this loan or grant now? Uh, my Current commissions will be normal, but in the future, my income certainly is at risk. Uh, Charlie, uh, if the, once the funds come in to the bank that is lending, the uh, making the loan, the bank needs to fund that loan within 10 days of its receipt of the funds or the funds go back to the program. 
So there's not much leeway to accept or reject at this point. Further, I don't suggest that if they have the opportunity to do so, to uh, put everything on hold. You don't know if and when those funds will be available yet again. I know Congress right now is in the process of trying to reauthorize additional funds past the original that was uh, quickly utilized. So uh, there, I don't see that there's a downside. Worst case scenario, you have a loan that will assist you in your compensation uh, and it's at 1%. So even if it's not forgiven, it's a 1% loan uh, and paid after two years. Bruce, do you have any thoughts on the issue? Yeah, I would, uh, I would just suggest that anyone that's operating as an S corporation may need to rethink their strategy for how they deal with compensation. A lot of S corporation owners take money out in the form of salary, and some take money out in the form of S corporation distributions. Well, oftentimes S corp owners will uh, will basically try and minimize their salary for payroll tax purposes. The opposite may take effect based on PPP money being available, and they may want to maximize the amount of uh, salary they take in the next eight weeks, uh, as that will perhaps increase the amount of the loan that's forgivable. Okay, I have a follow-up for John on the, uh, the prior question, um, putting yourself in the prior question about putting yourself in your customer's shoes, what about putting yourself in your principal shoes so that we, when we start to come out of this crisis, I'm still in a good place with my principals? Uh, good question. Thank you, Charlie. I think that the same, I, the same <clears throat> principle still applies that I was taught by my uh, dad when he started the agency, is that there's no such thing as over-communication. I, I have never had a principal uh, contact me and say, John, you are, you are over-communicating with me. Can you please stop calling me? So especially now when things are up in the air, uh, any manufacturer will be wondering, um, what is my sales force that is now grounded? What are, what are they doing? How, how are they uh, impacting the business? How are they growing the business? And um, are they staying busy? And uh, I like to get out in front of things with communication. So I uh, like to, any, if there's any issues, I like to address them up front. Uh, and like to put together a plan. So when I talk to my principal, we know exactly what's going to happen six days from now as well as six months from now. So uh, remember, they're, um, in good times, um, so any remote employee goes for rep or direct employee. Um, if you are out of sight and out of mind uh, and nobody ever hears from you, then the assumption is that you're not doing anything. So the um, uh, even in times like this, it is imperative, uh, maybe more so important, definitely more so important than normal times to communicate uh, what the plan is, how things are moving forward, and how you can help them with their business. Thank you. Uh, Bruce, I have a question. Can I borrow money from my retirement plan? Well, the uh, first comment I have is it depends on the type of retirement plan. Uh, typically, it would be a qualified plan like a 401k, profit sharing, something along those lines. Well, as, assuming the plans so provide, not all plans provide for loans, but if they do, yes, you can borrow money from the plans. <laughs> What the new uh, act, the CARES Act, does, uh, which is, of course, an acronym for the Coronavirus Aid, Relief, and Economic Security Act, in case anyone's interested, is it increases the maximum amount that you can borrow from $50,000 to $100,000. It also increases the amount that you can borrow uh, to, uh, you, previously you could not borrow more than 50% of your vested account balance. Now you can borrow up to 100% of your vested account balance. So it's the lesser of $100,000 or 100% of the vested account balance. That will apply to loans taken out within six months of the date of the enactment of CARES, which is uh, by September 23 of 2020. Thank you. Um, Dan, I heard that Congress is allocating additional funds to the payroll protection program, so I want to apply. What do I do? Could you give me a brief summary of the application process? Sure, well, we're all hoping that Congress will reallocate additional funds. Part of the process, of course, is you need to recognize this is not, the funds are not intended to offset business losses, loss of profit or sales or commissions. What it's intended to do is provide a means to pay employees compensation. It's not about what you make, but what you paid. So part of the application process is looking to what your payroll costs were last year and you're entitled based upon what that number may be and you can take into account any number of items including 
uh, cost of health insurance, uh, cost of retirement uh, uh, funds that were, were paid. Uh, you, have, uh, you have that and there's a formula two and a half times that amount with the documentation that you will provide. There's a formula on the application and it will then give you what is the maximum amount of that loan, possible loan that may be made available to you. You need to find a bank that is going to be accepting that application and we have found with many of the people we've dealt with, their, their local bank is a good source. Many local community banks, in fact, were able to process loans more expeditiously and get them funded than some of the more national larger, uh, uh, larger banks. Now, um, as far as the Paycheck uh, Protection Program, uh, the app, some of the key parts, the applicant uh, must have been in operation uh, as of February 15th of this year. Uh, they need to make a certify that the current economic uncertainty makes the loan request necessary to support ongoing operations of the applicant for purposes of payroll. And the funds are in fact used to retain and maintain payroll or they do allow certain mortgage interest payments and uh, lease payments and utility payments. So part of the process for the application is you need to get all of your financial and organizational documents in order. If you don't have, for instance, uh, some banks are requiring your articles of incorporation or your articles of organization or your bylaws, uh, copies of your financials, copies of tax returns. You need to get all of that in order so that you may you'll have everything that's necessary to submit with the application to the lender who will review it, likely review it with you, and then submit it for processing. Dan, I have a follow-up question on the payroll protection program. I'm a sole proprietor. Am I eligible for the payroll protection program loan? And if so, how can I use the funds? Well, two separate issues. Uh, one, a sole proprietor certainly is eligible uh, for uh, a loan under the PPP, as are independent contractors uh, and, and others. Uh, and for that, again, you will look to the income you had last year. Be mindful of that uh, some of the factors that go into the loan is uh, <laughs> that you cannot have, utilize income or payroll that's in excess of $100,000. So if some employees are making more, for instance, $150,000, you will use $100,000 of that amount. And then as part of the application process, you take the excess, which is the excluded amount, and that is deducted from the part that is in fact covered. And uh, uh, you can do that whether you're a sole proprietor or you're a member of an LLC or a partner or uh, an owner of a corporation. Um, but it is important that you not exceed or utilize more than $100,000 for pay compensation or uh, calculation of the uh, compensation that comes within the purview of the PPP. Bruce, I have a follow-up for, for your question. The question you were asked about borrowing money from a retirement plan, what about taking an early distribution from a retirement plan? So actually, the retirement plan withdrawals are an even better option than loans because you have the flexibility of taking a withdrawal, favorable tax consequences, and of course, if you choose to repay it, you're, um, you basically don't have to pay the tax. Um, in the past, when, in a, when an employee wanted to take money out of a retirement plan, they would have to take an early distribution. Uh, there'd be penalty taxes if they hadn't reached age 59 and a half, nor if they had, or if they had not met certain other exceptions. Now, with respect to certain kinds of plans, like profit sharing, 401k plans, IRAs, uh, participants are eligible to take money out of the plan, and there's a waiver of the 10% penalty tax, which might otherwise apply. And the income that has to be reported from that distribution uh, is taxed rapidly over three years, a third in 2020, a third in 21, and a third in 22. Um, the, the real benefit of the withdrawals versus the loans is that the withdrawals can be repaid within three years, and that will essentially uh, negate the tax consequences. So um, it, it's it's a it's a really effective options for persons that need the money. Thank you. Next question is going to come for uh, John Davis. Uh, John, what kinds of things have you been hearing from customers and uh, from principals about the ways that they are adapting to the new normal? 
And of those, what was the most surprising thing you heard? Well, I, I think from the customer side of things, um, I, there is certainly more of a, a human element in how people are doing business, and uh, business is continuing as normal. We deal with a lot of engineers, Charlie, and uh, a lot of those engineers now, and the, the first week this happened, everybody kept apologizing for their kids and their dogs in the background, and uh, now it's... Uh, uh, a lot of cameras are on where they were off before. Mm -hmm. uh, you hear the noises in the background, nobody says anything, and people are wearing, uh, you know, baseball caps and, and getting the work done. So the, the human element is seeing people out of the workplace in their homes, and it's it's kind of enjoyable, actually, and seeing how our customers actually, actually live. And uh, uh, a very interesting uh, humanitarian connection over an otherwise and human medium, right? So it's it's very good. Uh, so that that is surprising from the customer standpoint. From the principal standpoint, um, one of the things I've heard that is most surprising uh, is the phrase, "Well, you probably had a, have a lot of spare time on your hands now, so let's do X, Y, and Z." And this is one of those things that I've had to address and make sure that um, that everybody's on the same page with. Uh, I know a lot of my rep colleagues, as well as myself, have been very busy over the past several weeks. Probably in some ways busier than we were prior to COVID. And um, a lot of that is just trying to stay ahead of meeting with customers online. All of us are averaging two to three web meetings per day. Uh, the phone call volume has gone up. And in spite of uh, uh, not being able to visit customers, we are having many interactions with customers, maybe many more interactions with customers right now. So uh, just talking to principals and making sure that they know that we're, again, like I said in my first question, uh, over-communicating that we're still out there uh, trying to sell and trying to keep the wheels on the economy, as I told somebody the other day. Thank you. Cool. Um, question for Dan. I use 1099 sub reps, not W-2 employees. And I use the amounts I pay them to qualify for the payroll protection program. No. No. <laughs> <laughs> that was a quick answer. <laughs> That's the answer, unfortunately. Uh, well, I, I don't know if it's unfortunate or not. I know many reps utilize or call people independents and to make them 1099 sub-reps. Uh, but uh, the law, the uh, Paycheck Protection Program, does not allow the expense to be used in the calculation of the amount for a loan you know, nor for the proceeds used uh, to pay an independent um, contractor. Uh, independent contractors are eligible uh, to seek their own PPP loan. So uh, the answer is no. Got it. Um, Bruce, could you explain, please, the new above-the-line charitable contribution deduction? Yes. Uh, typically, you're not allowed to deduct your charitable contributions unless you're itemized. Uh, with the 2017 Tax Act, having increased the standard deduction of $12,000 per taxpayer or $24,000 for married taxpayers filing joint returns, and some other statutory changes, very few people, or shall I say a lot fewer people, are able to take advantage of charitable contribution deductions. For those who do not itemize their deductions, there's a $300 deduction allowed uh, regardless of whether you are actually if you don't itemize deductions so it comes off your 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 just your gross income um, it's basically it's not a big tax savings in any case of course but it's uh, it's allowable for contributions basically to public charities uh, certain types of private foundations um, and it helps all taxpayers again regardless of whether you itemize thank you uh, Dan I've got a follow-up to an earlier conversation we were having about the um, the $100,000 limit. And uh, the question being asked is, if you can't apply for employees who make more than $100,000, is not that penalizing my business for being successful? Well, remember, the purpose of this program is to um, compensate or assist companies to maintain their staff, and they're putting it more on an equal footing. Not everybody makes 100000 Not everybody makes more than 100000 uh, the CARES Act, which is uh, 800, over 800 pages of the most boring thing I've ever looked at, uh, uh, does provide that uh, someone who makes more than $100,000, the amount in excess of $100,000 can't be uh, utilized in calculation of the payroll costs for the application. Well, also, uh, I think one of the other questions uh, 
asked about the use, and I'm sure we'll go into that in a little more detail later, but when it comes to the use of those funds, you can use an amount that is equal to the annualized portion of that $100,000 because the use relates to the compensation or payroll used for eight weeks after a loan is funded. And that equals uh, $15,385 for an eight-week period, which is 850 seconds of you know, a year, $100,000 divided by 52 times eight. So it's a maximum of 15385 based upon what I've read. Thank you. Uh, Bruce, what is the new employee retention tax credit? Okay, basically it's a relief for certain businesses that have been affected by the uh, coronavirus. Uh, any business that's been fully or partially suspended due to COVID-19 or any business whose gross receipts during any calendar quarter are less than 50% of what they were during the prior year's calendar quarter is eligible for the employee retention credit. Um, basically, what it means is that there's a refundable payroll tax credit of 50% of wages paid to these employees during the crisis. It's limited to $5,000 per employee. For self-employed, the limit's 50% of employment income. And there's, of course, a number of technical requirements. One, of course, is that if you're, gro if you're relying on the gross receipts test versus the partial or full shutdown test, once your gross receipts reach 80% of the prior calendar quarter, then, of course, you are no longer eligible for the credit. But the credit comes off your quarterly payroll tax returns. And it's also one of the important things is it's a refundable credit. There's different types of credits which just offset your tax, but this is a credit which not only would offset your tax, but if the credit exceeds uh, what you paid or what your taxes, you can actually get money back from the government. Uh, and again, there's a number of technical requirements, and this is, this is like all of the tax provisions in this CARES Act, um, they're subject to many different types of interpretations which have not yet been issued. We're going to wait, need to see Treasury regulations, but so many things have been promulgated so quickly that there's, there's a lot of technical questions which we can't answer just yet, but we will see them, of course, in, in, in times to come. Thank you. Uh, back to Dan. Um, how, is, how can I uh, maximize the amount of my payroll protection program loan forgiveness? All right. We were talking earlier about the application process, and I know one of the earlier questions someone indicated they'd better prove so let's say that you have the funds, the bank has let you know that you have funds that will be funded within 10 days. From that date, the date you get the funds, uh, it starts the date for the eight-week period in which you, you, you will utilize the funds for the, uh, for the, under the provisions of the Act for that which may be forgiven. So you need to document this. It's very important to do that. I know a lot of people are putting PPP loan funds in a segregated account so that there is a record of everything those funds are used for. Uh, but to maximize the amount of forgiveness, not only there's two, there's two parts of the equation. One to look at, first of all, 75% of the funds must be utilized for payroll purposes, payroll costs. 25% uh, of the funds can be utilized for non-payroll costs, such as interest on a mortgage, rent payment, and utilities. Now, payroll costs include salary, includes wages, includes vacation pay. It includes uh, family medical leave act or sick leave, as long as it's not something that is reimbursing you for something under the FFCRA, which I'm sure we'll get a question on sometime. Um, it, it, it allows for uh, retirement benefits, group health benefits, all of that, those are eligible expenses, which uh, are, are part of the funds that you can, you, know, you can use the PPP funds for. You can't use them for payment of uh, accounts payable. You can't pay principal on your mortgage. Uh, you can't pay life insurance if you have a group life policy. 75% must be used for payroll costs, and you must document them. If you thought you had a lot to documents to gather for uh, the application process, you will have to even have more to establish how 
you use the funds if you want to have an element of forgiveness. The second part of the test is not only how you used it uh, as far as payroll costs, but also the number of employees that you currently have versus what you had in, a, in the prior time period. And I have a part of the act here, so let me just tell you, as part of the calculation, you need to look at the average number of employees you have for the eight-week period following the funding of the loan. Uh, you then look to the number of employees you had on average between February 15, 2019 and June 30, 2019. Also, the number of employees you had between January 1, 2020 and February 29, 2020. You will take the current number of employees, divide them either by one of the two periods, that, one from last year, one from this year. And if the number is equal to or larger than one, then the amount will be uh, potentially forgivable. Uh, that is the part of the test that people don't remember. Everyone says, I'll get the money and I'll use it only for payroll. But if you have cut your staff significantly, then the amount of payroll you use will be reduced on a proportionate level by the percentage of reduction in force. And one thing you can do, I know many companies have reduced or furloughed employees. If the, 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 the PPP, the CARES Act, provides that if you restore people to the payroll by June 30, you, those people can be utilized as far as the calculation of whether you are compliant with the PPP for purposes of forgiveness. Now, some of the problems with the Act is that the Act looks at an eight-week period. So if you get the, have received the funds already, that eight-week period will expire before June 30. So there are a lot of things in the Act which have not yet been melded together because on one hand, they allow you to look to June 30th to restore employees, but your eight-week time period may expire prior to that. So you need to really um, talk to your accountant, talk to your professionals, keep track of what you're doing, how you're utilizing the funds, to try to maximize the potential uh, uh, forgiven portion uh, that, uh, you know, under the Act. Okay. Um, the next question I've got is actually going to be for uh, John Davis. Uh, John, been, um, I'm seeing some, some best practices from some principles and some not best practices uh, to the extent that um, you can do so without identifying the guilty. Um, can you share I mean, the, the, what the best practices manufacturers have been, have been engaging in and maybe if there's things that need to be avoided, could you share what those are? Just as a, a, a comment to that, the companies that I represent or know of other rep colleagues who represent who hmm. have had a strong uh, marketing program and have been generally keeping up with the times, and uh, I'll leave that uh, subjectively defined so you can uh, – kind of fill in as, as whatever you define that as, but keeping up with the times when it comes to customer purchase behavior and that type of thing um, are actually weathering this quite well. And the best practices that they have are they, they understand their uh, marketing programs uh, very well. They have some type of online lead gathering system in place, and they have a very clear understanding of how they use their outside sales reps. And that understanding has just slightly morphed um, even though we are not actually uh, physically visiting customers, now that we are virtually visiting customers, we have very strong and very clear marching orders from them on, on uh, how we can do business for them. And frankly, the transition has been smooth and, and very easy. Uh, the bad practices, if you will, um, I, I think this whole event caught a lot of companies who maybe have been underinvesting in their marketing program and lead gen programs for quite some time caught them with their proverbial pants down, and uh, they do not have a good understanding of uh, how outside sales reps fit into a modern marketing channel. Maybe they don't even have a marketing program or lead gen program, and uh, they are usually the ones who, to an earlier comment, are saying, you know, now that you have a lot of free time on your hands, that, that type of comment. Um, so I think they're scrambling to try to figure out how to do business because it's something that they haven't been forced to think about prior to uh, to this event. So. What we're seeing from them, unfortunately, are a lot of uh, 
um, busy work, I would say, for the purpose of keeping keeping their Salesforce busy, uh, which uh, we are busy enough. <laughs> Thank you very much doing sales activity. But uh, uh, everybody is listening, and that's the good thing. And um, even the uh, manufacturers who haven't maybe put a lot of thought into this before, they're asking us the same questions, and they're saying, uh, hey, reps, how do we do better? So um, I think this is going to accelerate a lot of companies into the modern world in terms of marketing, lead gen, and sales. Thank you, John. Uh, for Bruce, uh, when is my 2019 federal income tax return due, and when are my 2020 estimated tax payments due? Not for a while. Um, <laughs> the <Congress has> extended <laughs> filing deadline for 2019 income tax returns, and the first two installments for 2020 estimated tax payments to July 15th of 2000. In 20. So <clears throat> you have you, you, if you haven't filed your tax return, you've got an automatic extension to July 15th. You don't have to file anything. Gift tax, you have to file. Those are extended to July 15th. Uh, estimated tax payments, the same. Again, keep in mind, I'm speaking about federal deadlines. State deadlines uh, are somewhat different. Like in, in Illinois, for example, the uh, first quarter estimated tax payment was still required to be made by April 15th of 2020 even though returns, uh, the return filing deadline and um, payment deadlines have been extended, the estimated tax payments were required to be made by April 15th. So you do have to check your states, but virtually all federal deadlines for filing have been extended to July 15th. For anyone that's doing anything a little more exotic, like investing in an opportunity zone to defer capital gains taxes or doing a tax deferred exchange, you also have some extensions to July 15th of 2020 as well. So there's considerable flexibility uh, to extend. Thank you. Dan, uh, we need to circle back, Dan, to the um, that $100,000 uh, limit. Um, and the, the question becomes, uh, when you talk about salary, is it salary or is it all employee benefits of a monetary value? It's the compensation part, uh, payroll. Uh, if it does not include uh, benefits uh, such as health care benefits or retirement funds, that could be in addition to the normal compensation. And also one of the factors that uh, the government's going to look to, and by the way, it's ultimately not the government that will determine the forgiveness. It's an application that you will make. If you have a loan, mm -hmm. you keep in touch with your bank because ultimately you will need to get the form from the bank requesting forgiveness uh, of the loan. It's the bank that will give you the form. You will submit it with the documentation, and ultimately the bank will make the decision. Uh, at this point, I'm not aware that the form that the PPP program will, will require for the bank for to give its, uh, its, its borrowers has yet been prepared. This is, again, a, a moving target not only for uh, businesses but also for the government. Uh, Rules change. Uh, when the uh, PPP program first was enacted, and there wasn't a 75% uh, uh, requirement for payroll. It was uh, was open. After after the fact, they had a regulation which said 75%. So things are a moving target. But as far as your specific question, it's only the compensation part, the payroll part, that is limited to 100,000. If you make more than 100,000, you can include the additional benefits you receive that are included within the scope mm -hmm. of uh, the PPP. Got it. Okay. Um, back to Bruce. And how did the new rules work on required minimum distributions for 2020? Congress has given everyone a holiday for 2020 minimum distributions. Um, participants in retirement plans who have reached a certain age are generally required to withdraw funds from their retirement accounts each year, generally over their life expectancy. Some of you may remember the Great Recession in 2009. Congress made the same change. They allowed participants to skip a year of minimum distributions. And what that does is that means when the market is down, as is currently the case, you have the option of not taking money out of your retirement account, which is great for people that have the money that are retired and that can find other resources with which 
to take money to, to, to subsidize their standard of living. Now, for uh, people that cannot, of course, it's not that, that terrific of a benefit. Um, one of the options those people do have is take what you need out of the plan, potentially, uh, but maybe not take the full amount out, or perhaps take out your distribution in kind and maybe not cash it in right away or sell it right away, but wait a little bit until you have some flexibility. Now, one, of the, one of the unfortunate things is, is some people take their required minimum distributions out in January. And what a lot of people have asked is, do I have the opportunity to pay it back? And the answer is no. However, if you've, for whatever reason, taken out your 2020 minimum required distribution and it's less than 60 days since the time you took it out, you may have the opportunity to roll the money back into your plan and thereby avoid the tax for the 2020 year. But to the extent that you qualify, obviously to the extent that you don't need the money, <clears throat> if you have the money in your retirement account, um, particularly if it's invested in equities, mutual funds, stocks, whatever the case may be, which have depreciated in value, this is a real benefit and one you should take advantage by leaving the money in the plan. Um, and, and this may be a little bit too arcane, but I'll go ahead and ask it. Um, with on minimum required distributions, uh, there are also minimum required distributions for inherited IRAs. Is there a holiday for those as well? Yes. Yeah. Inherited IRA is basically an IRA which is paid to someone other than a spouse. Mm -hmm. yeah. So there is a similar uh, one-year holiday as well. Got it. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Dan? Uh, the next question coming up is, can the payroll protection program loan proceeds be used to cover paid sick leave? How about separation or retirement pay? The answer is yes. It could be for used for sick leave except for a reimbursement to a company for what they be paying under the uh, FFCRA. It could also be used uh, for separation or retirement pay as well. So that is allowed and would be deemed part of the forgivable nature of the loan. Can an employer require uh, one of its employees to, to utilize the benefits under the FCRA, which stands for the Family's First Coronavirus Response Act? Uh, and just as first we should say what, that's, what, what that is, that predated the uh, PPP and it was the first legislation that was specifically enacted to deal with the issues uh, being confronted by COVID. And this allows and expanded upon uh, the existing law under the Family Medical Leave Act and uh, mandated that employees uh, could utilize um, uh, the expanded FFCRA to take up to 12 weeks of uh, leave of absence under certain circumstances from their employer. Now, first, before we uh, to get into the specifics of the, of the program, before we get to that specific question, the expanded program was for uh, persons that have at least 50 employees, and um, uh, that it's to respond to quarantine requirements if someone is ill, uh, care for a family member who's ill, or to care for a minor child. Uh, under the program, the, uh, for instance, the expanded FMLA, you have 10 days, which is unpaid, and thereafter, it can be paid. So if you're taking care of a child, you can get up to $200 a day uh, for uh, a maximum period. Uh, you have sick leave as well, uh, which provides you up to $511 a day for a maximum of 10 days of $5,110. Um, I, I'm aware that some companies have wanted to continue to pay their, uh, their personnel even if they're off-site and not necessarily working. They've been very generous. Uh, and we have advised those, those companies to consider, um, instead of doing that, uh, to uh, utilize the funds uh, that are uh, available for that purpose because at the end of the day, the funds that you expend under the FFCRA uh, are recoverable from the, the government through, uh, through taxes. Yes. Um, to, to circle back to what we can and can't require our employees to do, um, the question comes in, I'm concerned that my employee may be infected with COVID-19. I would like to prevent other employees from becoming infected. 
while working, what information can I inquire about an employee's health condition as it relates to COVID-19? Well, I'll, I'll jump in right now. Ordinarily, the law does not allow you to make inquiry regarding uh, uh, certainly a uh, person suffering from a disability or, or illness. The law has been, in fact, amended at this point to provide that if an employee presents at work uh, and you believe that person is ill, um, you can require that person to take a have a have a uh, uh, temperature taken and uh, ask if they're if they're feeling ill, and you can ask that person to leave. Uh, as as always, you have to make sure you do it uniformly across the board, and not just uh, on a selective basis. Um, you uh, you can also, if someone wants to take under the FFCRA, for instance, uh, they want to leave uh, because they feel ill. There is a whole gamut of documents that can be, and information that can be requested by an employer who is the health care provider uh, to get documentation of that, when was, what is the nature of the illness. So yes, uh, there is requirements that you get documentation uh, and you also have the ability as an employer to require your employee to leave and or to submit to a test such as uh, taking a temperature to see if they are ill. Thank you. Um, mm -hmm. This next question uh, looks like it goes to John Davis. Um, John, with respect to rep councils, are you seeing manufacturers uh, have their rep councils, uh, consult their rep councils specifically relating to COVID-19? Are you seeing rep councils sort of informally meet without maybe having the manufacturer request them to? And are you seeing it happen and should it be happening? <clears throat> Good question. Um, I have not seen it happen officially yet. I, I do have one principal in particular that has set up a, uh, right now it's weekly, but it'll probably go to bi-weekly and then probably monthly um, uh, Zoom meeting, or, or it doesn't have to be Zoom, but online status call with uh, all of the reps. And it's uh, turned into actually a very good use of time. They keep it under 45 minutes and uh, uh, at first, it was related to how to do business, and then it is just updates on new product developments and that type of thing, so an informa information sharing. Uh, although I haven't seen any official requests for rep councils to get together, because I, I am on several of them with uh, different manufacturers, uh, I would not be surprised if now that things have settled down a little bit, and hopefully we'll be resuming some level of normalcy, whatever normalcy will, will look like going forward, uh, I would expect to see a rep council meeting um, to get together, and I would hope so too, because I, I, I think whatever happens from here on out, we're not going to go back to pre-COVID-19 methods of doing business, and it would be good to get everybody on the same page and strategize how to best move forward. Thank you. Um, I have a follow-up question to the one that Dan had just answered regarding having a, an employee possibly with COVID-19, uh, if an employee comes down with COVID-19, can they file a workers' compensation claim? And if they do, how can they prove they caught it in the office? Good question. It has come up. Um, the issue is, first of all, that's a, each state has its own laws, body of laws dealing with workers' comp. So, there isn't a federal rule in that regard, so I cannot uh, tell you specifically or those listening what your states may have or have not. I can tell you in Illinois, uh, they have passed a, a law which amends the workers' comp statute, which provides that if you require employees to come to work because you are in an essential or critical industry as defined by law, and if that person does, in fact, such as a, uh, someone working at a grocery store, um, if that person does come down with COVID-19 in Illinois, there is a presumption, a rebuttable presumption, but a presumption nonetheless that the person uh, incurred the disease as a result of work. And as such can, in fact, present a workers' comp claim with respect to uh, getting COVID-19. Uh, there, there's That's a rebuttable presumption, but it's a strong presumption in favor of the employee. That is not in general the case. 
a follow-up on the topic of sick employees. Uh, my business employs only 10 people, which means I'm not covered by ADA or FMLA. Uh, I understand that FLM, FMLA was recently expanded to require small businesses such as mine to provide paid sick leave to employees with COVID-19. When is an employee entitled to paid sick leave for this uh, it's less than 10 people employer? That, that is correct. Uh, the, under the FFCRA, it was, the law was amended to provide for uh, any employer. Uh, essentially a small employer, one or two people, uh, do have to provide sick leave. However, and we've already discussed what the parameters are under the FFCRA. However, the law does provide for an exception for small businesses, and that's with fewer than 50. And I think I said earlier, fewer than 50 for the FFCRA, that's fewer than 500. But the small business exception is for 50. And if you can show the following three factors, you may be exempt from compliance with the FFCRA, that the provision of paid sick leave would exceed available business revenues and cause a hardship to the business. Uh, there would be a substantial risk to the financial health of the business, and there are not sufficient workers who are able, willing, and qualified to work in the business. So you, you can, if you are a small business, seek to be exempt, even if an employee says, I need to I get the benefits under the F FCRA, the law does take into account a small business. Now, there's definitions of what makes a small business and uh, certain other requirements, but if you are, in fact, a business that has less than 50 employees and you have issues with FFCRA, be mindful that there are and there is an exception specifically for small businesses. Um, I have a, a question that will probably go to any or all. Um, what kind of issues are you facing uh, when you have employees who have not in the past worked from home, work from home, uh, the legal issues for our attorneys and the business issues for our rep? We, we have, uh, gosh, for the past um, 13 or 14 years, we somewhere in that time frame, we have operated uh, virtually. So um, all of us, uh, including our inside salespeople and um, uh, our bookkeeper and the outside salespeople, of course, we all work out of our home offices, and um, we've already had that infrastructure in place. So I, I don't, uh, I don't know if I'm, I'm the right person to answer that question. I, I will say that we did shore up uh, our resources and uh, make sure that everybody has access to some type of web conferencing system. We, we have the right type of uh, equipment, you know, Bluetooth headsets, that, that, that type of thing. But um, our email and our video conferencing and everything has been in the cloud for years now, so we haven't, haven't really seen a disruption there. Um, yeah, and from a manufacturer standpoint, with our manufacturers, they uh, again, it kind of goes back to companies who have been keeping up with the times, so to speak, and they've invested in cloud uh, technology, and uh, maybe they've been trying to attract employees by offering a day or two to work from home as part of a uh, incentive package or recruitment package. Those companies are faring pretty well. If, if you have a little bit of the infrastructure, flipping the switch to make it a, a full-time work from home deal is, uh, is not that hard. Let me jump in there. Um and remind employers, and I guess employees as well, um, issues dealing with working at home. The laws still apply. Uh, wage and hour laws still apply. That's because someone might be uh, working at home. If you send an email and expect a response on a Saturday or even on a Tuesday night after they've put in a full day, you potentially, if this person is already is someone who's normally subject to overtime issues, is entitled to overtime. You cannot have more hours just because they happen to be uh, wearing shorts and a sweatshirt and walking around their house. So you have to remember that the laws relating to, to labor still and, and business still remain in effect. The other thing you have to be mindful of is with remote working, uh, if, you, if your company has not done that and not been on the cloud, you have cybersecurity issues. And as reps, you have and share confidential information. You may be dealing with customers and 
talking about their whether they're making proposals and understanding what their business needs are or dealing with your principal. And if that's the case and your system is not secure, you could be jeopardizing the business of not only your employer or your company, but your principal and your customer. So it's vital that you maintain your, uh, your computer system and have the necessary safeguards and firewalls in place. Otherwise, you could be violating indirectly uh, a contract. Your rep agreement provides for confidentiality. There's legal issues as well. So the two things that I think about when I think about people working at home, you deal with the need to maintain the same laws and the need to maintain security. And I know there was a question earlier regarding workers' compensation in the workplace. Um, there has been worker compensation claims, again, on a state-by-state -state basis, but I'm aware of one in Illinois dealing with a sales rep who got injured at home while working and was uh, able to submit a, a claim for workers' compensation. So the laws are not suspended because you happen to be working at your dining room table. Yeah, Dan, that, that's an excellent point, and I'll, I'll jump back in here and, and piggyback on that, too. Uh, one aspect would be the very first question that Charlie asked me in this is how, how are you connecting with customers and, and finding common ground? I am finding that uh, uh, all of the trials and tribulations of working from home, um, we have figured out a long time ago because we've been doing it for so long. But my customers who are new to working at home, especially if they've always worked in an office, uh, the ones that I know well, I've become a, a bit of a counselor to them. Like it's, you know, especially when I hear them saying, well, I worked 12 hours, you know, four days in a row and uh, um, I worked on Saturday. It's like, you know, it is okay to turn your phone off. So we, we have to remember, um, or uh, I have to remember to tell them that work hours still apply so you don't lose your mind. Um, but uh, from the cybersecurity standpoint, I, this is anecdotal, but uh, I have noticed that there have been a significant uptick in the number of phishing emails and uh, nefarious actors online trying to get your information. Uh, criminals know full well, and remember, too, that uh, this is big business for um, all kinds of people and governments and countries you don't like of uh, ransomware and stealing people's information and everything else. And whenever there's disruption and uh, uh, the world like there is now, they will take advantage of it to try to make more money through stealing your information and everything else. So uh, a little bit of investment in talking to somebody who understands cybersecurity to do a, a checkup on uh, how you are doing things, especially if you are working from home, would be money well spent right now. And to Dan's point, you uh, we all have confidentiality clauses in our contracts. And uh, now more than ever, we need to make sure that we are upholding that, that end of the bargain. You know, for, for what it's worth, uh, MANA moved to virtual offices six or seven years ago. And, and so we were able to do it in a very orderly and planned way. Little things like uh, I just, we had employees in California and discovered that California requires a very specific fire extinguisher be in place in every workplace. Uh, it had to be capable of extinguishing electrical and non-electrical fires. So uh, every man employee has at their desk in their virtual home office, a fire extinguisher, because that's what the law requires. Circling back to uh, legal questions, how does force majeure uh, factor in, um, in things like, do I have to pay my rent? And conversely, do my uh, principals still have to pay me? Well, first, force majeure uh, stands for superior force. We may all be mindful of that term, but what it really is is, is there an unforeseeable circumstance that will allow, that prevents a party from performing in accordance with the terms of a contract? And as a matter of contract provision, does it allow that non-performance? Uh, that was one of the very first questions we were getting from a lot of people at the start of this. Uh, do I have to pay my rent? Do I have to pay my mortgage? Uh, do my principals have to pay me? And generally, you have to look at the contract language uh, number one. And number two, the answer is, short answer, yes, you have to pay your obligations. Uh, you have to generally, unless the contract, and usually landlord contracts say there's force majeure for everything other than your obligation to pay rent. Uh, the question is whether or not the ultimate purpose of the contract is being frustrated as a result of the unforeseen event. So 
for instance, if a rep agreement requires that you make in-person calls on your clients or your customers and you can't, is that a force majeure? Mm -hmm. Probably so. If it says that you uh, have to make reports as to your contacts with customers and uh, you have contact, then you should continue to make your reports. Can someone stop making the payments? Probably not. But again, you have to look at the force majeure clause itself. Okay, I've, I've got, uh, we're coming up on, uh, on the end of our hour. I've got one final question that's going to be for John Davis. Charlie Ingram, who is vice president and um, vice president of sales and marketing at Ears Manufacturing, has commented that in a COVID-19 environment, having uh, his local guys locked up in, in quarantine uh, has made it very valuable to have reps that uh, having reps gets him closer to the customer, both physically and commercially, and gets him better intelligence. And, and uh, as our final question of the day, could I ask you to just comment on that? Well, I, I, hello, Charlie. How are you? How are you doing, Charlie Ingram? Um, always a pleasure. And uh, I, yeah, I mean, Charlie couldn't have said it better. Um, we are here, and uh, from a customer relationship standpoint, uh, reps are still well positioned to get in front of customers, and that's what we've been doing. Frankly, the only thing that's changed in our job role is that we can't see customers physically. And leading up to COVID-19, that was maybe only 20 to 30 percent of what we did. A lot of customer contact in the modern age is done via phone and a little bit of web meeting, and now a lot of it's done during web meetings. So uh, we are here to help. And if we have to go visit somebody who is an essential business, we are certainly able to get there because we're uh, usually driving distance away from, from where they're at. So Charlie has a good point and um, I appreciate that. Thank you. Uh, that's our hour. Uh, I want to thank our panelists, John Davis of Paul Davis Automation, Dan Biederman and Bruce Bell from Schoenberg, Finkel, Newman and Rosenberg, LLC. I'm Charlie Cohn. Thank you for being with us. Be safe. Thanks, Charlie. Thank you. Stay well.